When taking a look at your spending and making small adjustments can make a massive difference. God, I really wish something like this existed for personal finance. Have you taken any steps in your life to forward your financial plan? Simple changes to your budget can mean huge savings. It's not how much money you earn, it is what you do with the money that matters. Hi, welcome to week two of our series on money called Wealth Management. Today, we're gonna to talk about some very practical things that the Bible says about money. Now, this is going to be applicable to you if you're a school teacher who maybe doesn't make a lot of money or you're some sort of wealthy internet mogul who invented the dot in dot com. It's all gonna be applicable to you. Now, I wanna warn you of something. We're gonna to talk today about what the Bible says in terms of how to make more money. Now, I don't know about you, but there's something in me, there's like a gag reflex in me that gets uncomfortable thinking, wait, the Bible's going to tell me how to make more money. I don't know about you, but I grew up so steeped in Bible verses like where it says, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. That's Jesus. And when Jesus talks to the rich young ruler and says, give away everything you have. And Jesus saying, you can't serve God and money. There's something in me that gets really uncomfortable thinking that the Bible might possibly talk about making more money. But I actually think that the verses I just talked about, that's just one limited section of what the Bible has to say about money. So let me establish this up front. The Bible and God is patently anti-greed. So here's something that Jesus says. In the book of Luke, it says this. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, hey, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. <laughs> so Jesus replied, and I love this reply from Jesus, man, I love you called him man. Man, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And Jesus said, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. So we see right here that God is saying, Jesus is saying, look, don't be greedy. Don't collect and collect and collect for yourself. That's no good. That is anti-God. It's not what God has lined up for us. Storing up and cushing up your life with money isn't the point of God giving us money. And there's also this warning in the book of 1 Timothy 6.10. The love of money, not money itself, Loving money is a root of all kinds of evil things. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul is warning Jesus followers and he's saying, hey, be careful. If you love money and just want to accumulate and accumulate and do great stuff for yourself, oh, that can lead you away from God. So those are some of the warnings in the Bible about greed. So let's just say right now, let's all agree that God does not want us to be greedy. There is danger in being greedy. But that is not the complete picture of what God has to say about money in the scriptures. It's one part of it. And if we just hold on to those verses, we're a little like someone who has heard about people who um, get injured playing a sport or exercising. And so we choose not to exercise at all. And we just pull away from it altogether. Or we're someone who's actually making money and we're a Jesus follower. And there might be something in us that feels secretly guilty about that. I wanna disabuse us of those notions and lead us into a fuller, more holistic picture of what God has to say about money. Because the fact is, there are lots of godly, wealthy people in the Bible. If God was anti-money, 
You would think that every time we open scripture, we would see God interacting with strictly poor people, but that's not the case. He interacts with the poor and he interacts with the wealthy. In the New Testament, people like Joseph of Arimathea who gave Jesus his body, his tomb. Uh, Peter and his family are known to be wealthy people, relatively wealthy people. Luke, the doctor, was probably a wealthy individual. Lydia, Mary Magdalene, Dorcas, Cornelius, Jason, Aquila and Priscilla, Ananias and Sapphira, Matthew, Philemon, all of these people had a fair amount of means. And in the Old Testament, we see people like Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Lot, Boaz in the book of Ruth, Abigail, Nabal, David, Solomon, Job. And Jewish people, they, and Jesus was Jewish, they looked at the entire history of Israel when they thought about concepts like money, and they would look back to Abraham, the father of their faith. And it is known in scripture, Abraham was a very wealthy man, both before he interacted with God and met God and started following God, and even more so after. So we can't look at scriptures and go, huh, God only interacts with poor people. That's not the case. He interacts with the poor and he interacts with the wealthy. Which leads to this question, why does God give us money? Why does God give us money? Well, there's a few answers here, but the, maybe the most basic one is this, provision. He gives us money to provide for us. It says in scripture over and over again, he's a good father. And a good father provides for his children the things that they need, food, shelter, clothing, all of those things. Jesus says over and over this idea. And he talks about when you follow me, I'm gonna take care of you. I'm gonna provide for you. And by the way, I don't think God's a skin flint in that. I think he's actually quite generous. But here's the other thing about money. So not only is it provision, it's this. And I want you to really catch this. Money is one of God's ways of growing responsibility in us. And when I say growing responsibility in us, that's applicable if you happen to be a 15-year-old watching this or if you are even a 65 or 70 year old watching this. God wants to use money because we've all got to interact with money somehow, right? God wants to use money to grow responsibility within us. God is clever and he's using this for those purposes. And within that, under that banner of responsibility are two key questions. Number one is this, how will we get the money that we're going to be using in life? And two, what will we use it for? How are we going to get it and what will we use it for? And this comes back to this mindset shift, comes back to what Ron talked about last week. If you haven't watched Ron's talk last week, please go back and look at it. It's a great foundational talk about money. And he says there's two mindsets we can have about money. You can either look at money as an owner or as a steward. And the steward way of looking at money is the biblical way of looking at money. The owner way of looking at money is the world's way of looking at money. An owner says, I don't know, it's mine. I'll do with it what I want. I'll just kind of live how I want with it. I mean, it's mine. A steward way of looking at money means you're caretaking that money. It has been loaned out to you, maybe for a short period of time, maybe for a lifetime, maybe longer. And it's on you to take care of that money and to do something good with that money. So you've got the steward view of money and the owner view of money. And we want to consistently push ourselves towards this steward view of money. Steward means to be responsible for it. You want to be responsible for the things that God has loaned out to you, that money God has loaned out to you. So let me tell you a little bit about my two little girls. I've got two girls, May May and Bomber. They're now uh, eight and six. And when they were young, when they were little babies, you don't leave a baby alone. Okay, that, if you're a new parent, maybe I need to tell you this, don't leave a baby alone. But over time, you start to figure out ways to build into them some responsibility, some ownership of the time they have. And so what my wife and I would start doing is we would let the girls be alone, not alone in the house, but alone in their room when they were like one and a half or two. 
And we would maybe let them be alone in their room for half an hour to do what they're gonna do. And then they, okay, that's enough time. And then we'd build that out a little more and build that out a little more and build that out a little more. And it might have to be room time. It might be time them playing over in the basement or it might be time the two of them playing off together. Now, normally they're with us and we're watching out for them, making sure they're doing all the right things and not you know, doing something crazy. But we wanted to start to build into them this training. We wanted to train them to use that time towards something that was good. And so sometimes our girls would go in their rooms and, and maybe they would sit and read a book. That's what my, May May loves to do. She loves to sit in her room and read a book. Jules, bomber, she loves to go in her room and brush her doll's hair. And sometimes they'll do a little craft thing. They've got, they've got scissors in there and markers and they might make something. Or they might do something for someone else. Lately, May May has been working on this cool birthday gift thing she's been wanting to give to Bomber. Whatever they're doing in there, as long as it's not destructive, we know it's good. And so we're giving them that time more and more to help grow in them this ownership of their time, this responsibility. Now, what would it look like if they were terrible at room time, if they were terrible at being alone? They would be destructive. They'd go in their room and they would just start tearing it up. They'd pull everything out of the closet. They'd get the craft stuff and just start cutting everything, including their hair and maybe their, their sheets on their bed. Uh, real quick aside, we were at someone's house recently. They had white carpet. The house was a disaster. They had two little kids. It was clear they allowed their two little children to take markers and write all over the carpet. Ah, good for resale value. It was insane. And I think about those kids and think, no one trained them to behave well when they were alone. So it's on us to train our little girls to handle room time in a way that actually produces good things, might produce rest in them, foster their imagination, their creativity, um, that they would, they would just get a good reset in there, maybe reading, whatever that is. So we're using alone time to grow in them and then eventually, because eventually, you know what's gonna happen? They're gonna have a lot of alone time. They're gonna leave. They're gonna go to college. They're gonna get married. They're gonna be away from us. And we wanna build it into where when they get to that spot, we don't have to have them in the house all the time to make sure they're doing right. We're training them. God does the same thing with us, with money. He entrusts us with bits of money. And he's looking at us and going, how are you going to steward this? How are you going to take care of this? And how are you going to turn this maybe into something more? Are you gonna do it the world's way or are you gonna do it in a godly way? Just like my wife and I are training our daughters, God wants to use money to train us. Now, we talked about two key questions of responsibility with money. How will we get it and what will we use it for? And we'll get to how will we get it in a moment. But first, I wanna talk about what we can use it for. We can use money to do amazing things in this world. Can you use it to buy a yacht? Sure. Is that ungodly to do? I don't know. You'll have to ask God for you on that. But we can think about money as ways to have a impact on the world around us. I've talked about this before. I'll restate it real quickly. Uh, there are this guy, Mike Brini, he wrote a book about this. It's worth looking into. He talks about five capitals, five capitals. And capital is our resources we have. And the capitals go like this, from least important to most important. They go financial, intellectual, physical, relational, spiritual. So it goes financial, intellectual, physical, relational, spiritual. More value, the higher you get to the top. And anytime you can trade one of the lower ones for something higher, that's a good trade. What's at the bottom of the list? Financial. Why? Because you can use financial to build it in the next thing, build it in the next thing, build it in the next thing, but in and of itself, it's no good. And God wants us to prosper in each of these areas. So spiritually, that means growing so we're more godly and Christ-like and building into others. Relationally, so that you're deeply connected with wonderful friends, live at peace with those around you and have the right, uh, the right kinds of people who come alongside you and grow you and that you grow them. Physically, so that your rhythms are life-giving and you live out the fullness of your days. 
intellectually so that your mind is renewed at peace, creative, and anchored in God's word. And the lowest though is financial so that you prosper. You're provided for by your loving father with plenty to give to your family, to the family of faith, and to others. So we can use this financial capital to build into ourselves intellectual capital, physical capital, relational capital, and hopefully ultimately spiritual capital. I'm giving this a short shrift. There's a lot more to go into there. Find Mike Breen's book about the five capitals. If that's interesting to you, learn more about it because there's a lot to that. It's a good way of thinking about your resources and how you can build into the kingdom of heaven. So what will we use our money for? Not necessarily greed and luxurious living or whatever I want, but intentional thinking about how I can help uh, create a different world around me that brings more of the kingdom of heaven around. So that second question and responsibility, the first one was, or the second one was, what will we do with it? This first one is, how do we get it? And again, I wanna say this is applicable for teachers or your internet moguls, whoever it is, this is all applicable. I was talking to my friend, Stephen, who uh, runs a great blog called Abraham's Wallet, and which is a fun name, but it's, it's thinking about money from a biblical perspective. And he's also a financial advisor. So I was asking him a bunch of questions about all this stuff. And he says that scripture says there are five ways, five key ways of gaining wealth. And I say, isn't that word wealth kind of a lightning rod? We, we go, oh, wealthy. God wants me to be wealthy. That doesn't sound very biblical. But like we saw earlier, maybe God is wanting to give you more of these resources because you've been faithful and you can do more things with them. So how are you meant to grow those things? Well, he says there's five things in scripture. Number one is you're meant to work for a living, not just sit around going, well, I hope money shows up, but you actually work for a living. The second is that you don't have debt. That means among other things, you live within your means. We'll talk about more of that in a minute and we're gonna talk about how to get rid of debt in a few weeks. It means you save for the future. Number four, it means you be a giver, particularly to the family of faith and to the poor. You are generous. And five, you build wealth little by little. This means year by year and even going on out generation by generation. And we're gonna talk about a couple of those a little more specifically here in a moment. What you see in all of that, those five things in wealth building, God is using it to increase your character, to grow you, to grow you responsibly, to grow you in responsibility. Because none of that stuff is easy, is it? Work for a living, don't have debt, save for the future, be a giver, build wealth little by little. That's not easy. None of that is easy. But God has it that way so that he can grow us and grow our character. This is the exact opposite of what we hear, the prosperity gospel. And if you don't know what that is, that's, that's when, you, when you, a lot of times you'll see these uh, pastors on TV going, God just wants you to be rich, so pray for it and boom, here it is. And that is not how God operates most of the time. I asked Stephen about this. I said, well, tell me more about the prosperity gospel. And he says, the problems with the prosperity gospel are threefold. Number one, there's no call to faithfulness over decades or generations. And that's how you build your character. Number two, it comes from a poverty mindset that says God wants you to be rich instead of being someone who looks at money as a way of stewarding wealth. And number three, it cuts out all the Lord says in the scripture about suffering and growth. Suffering is a magical element in a disciple's development and the prosperity gospel types, they don't seem to want that. So prosperity gospel is not what God is about, but growing things over time, sometimes through challenges, is how God wants to build wealth in us and grow us as humans. So now when we talk about how to get it, we're gonna talk about two of the things he listed, saving for the future and building wealth little by little. And we're gonna take our cues. We're, I'm gonna read 10 verses, 10 verses. And they're all from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is this wonderful little book, almost right in the middle of your Bible. And it's written by Solomon. Solomon was King David's son. And Solomon was one of the richest men who ever lived. 
And Solomon wrote this book to his sons and to anybody else who would read it, including us here in this year, uh, so many years later, to teach us practical things about living. So I'm gonna read you 10 passages from the book of Proverbs. And maybe you just sit and let these wash over you, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask God to highlight one or two as you hear these. And maybe something will grab you. And maybe something will make you go, huh, huh, I'm meant to look at money a little bit differently. The first is this in Proverbs 6. It says this, Solomon says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Whoa, what? <laughs> He's saying, look at an ant. If you have any laziness in you, that's what a sluggard is. Sluggard lay about playing video games all day. He says, look at the ant. Consider its ways and you'll be wise. This ant has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summertime and then gathers its food and harvest. So how long are you gonna lie there, you sluggard? When are you gonna get up from your sleep? Oh, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands and rest. And poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed bandit. So Solomon in scriptures, God writing through Solomon is saying, I don't want you to just be lazy and not gain wealth that you can do good things with. So look at the ant. Look how he stores up, stores up, stores up so he has something later. The next one's in Proverbs 13, 11. Dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever, whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Little by little, little by little. Not, whoop, I won the lotto. Little by little, little by little. This is how God wants to grow money in our lives, little by little. Proverbs 10, four. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands Bring wealth, work, work. Proverbs 28, 20. A faithful person, someone who's building in little by little, little by little, will be richly blessed. But one who's just eager to get rich real fast, they're not gonna go unpunished. Bad stuff's gonna happen for them. Proverbs 10, four through five. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. He who gathers crops in summer is a prudent son. But he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. Work, get, plant here, harvest here. Proverbs 24, 27, put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. After that, build your house. Earn and then spend. Don't spend and then earn. Proverbs 21, 20, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. They just consume, consume, consume. But the wise person is prudent about how they store things up for just the right time. Proverbs 21, 5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Don't jump in fast to something, but plan out and think little by little over a long period of time. Proverbs 20, 13, don't love sleep or you will grow poor. Stay awake and you'll have food to spare. This one makes me think of a great quote by Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison said, opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. Isn't that great? That's good for Millennials, anyway, and also there's a great poem by uh, Johann Wolfgang Goethe. It's called Perseverance, and he says this, we must not hope to be mowers and to gather the ripe gold ears unless we have first been sowers and watered the furrows with tears. We can't expect to have, we haven't planted. And finally, Proverbs 30, 25, just to come back to the ants. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. I hope what you hear in all 10 of these verses is this idea of saving, living little by little, growing little by little, little by little, being faithful in your work, being faithful to take your money and do something responsible with it, being faithful over a long period of time. This world and all the things we read about online and in magazines, whatever, that says, this person just suddenly got real rich. We all look at those and go, I want that. Now, does God work that way sometimes? Sure, sometimes, but more often than not, way more often than not, it's little by little, little by little, little by little being faithful because God wants to 
train us. Maybe the thing about money is this. Maybe money isn't about money. Maybe money is a training vehicle for us to grow in our character, both in how we get the money and what we end up doing with the money. So here's some practical steps that you can apply from this. Number one, have a job. Don't be on the lookout for get rich quick schemes, especially if you're young. Start putting your time in, have a job. Show up at work, do the work and be done with the work and then do it again the next day and the next day and have a weekend. Focus on mickles, not muckles. There's an old saying, uh, I've quoted it many times, many a mickle makes a muckle. And what it means is many a small things, mickles add up to a big thing, a muckle. Many a mickle makes a muckle. Save more, spend less. Save more, sock away money regularly. They say that if you have to put $1,000 a year into some sort of retirement account, after 40 years, you'll probably have almost a million dollars. Ron was telling me about a pastor he heard about who finally retired. This guy never made hardly any money. And yet when he retired, he'd socked enough away. The financial advisor guy's looking at him going, you know, you have a million dollars. Oh no, I didn't know that. He was just faithful to save over time. This is the idea of compounded interest. You ever, you ever heard of this? Uh, it's an old story that there was a guy who had a chessboard and he, was at, he, was, he had two options. Either take a big pile of rice, here, here you can have this pile, or how about this? On the first square, I'll put one grain of rice and on the second, I'll double it. And on the third, I'll double that. And on the fourth, I'll double that. And he said, which do you want? And the guy thought about it and he said, I'll take the doubling because catch this, by the 64th, square, he would have a quadrillion grains of rice. That is 2000 times the annual global rice production. Little by little, by little, by little, by little, by little. Save more, spend less. Do you live simply? Could you live a little simpler? It's not about living high on the hog, as we say in Texas. It means living more simply. Does that mean luxury items are off? No, no, no. But it means you turn to God and ask and you consider it and go, is this what you want for me? Or is this not what you want for me? But live simply. We we're talking in our team, our teaching team meeting this week and Jason pointed out that he's heard this many times and I think it's true. It's harder to spend less later. So don't think, well, I'll spend a bunch now and then later I'll curtail my spending. That is very hard to do. It's hard to turn that battleship around. Live within your means. How much do you make? Spend less than that. Spend a lot less than that. That way you can save. It's a cliche to say, but I have to say it. We live in the credit card culture. We live in the world that says, look around and go, uh, who, what do they have? I, 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 well, I, I need to have that. I need to have that phone. I need to have that watch. I need to do these... Can you afford that? Can you afford that? Don't go into debt. Scripture has a lot to say about debt and we're gonna talk about that in a few weeks. Be faithful with what you have. What has God given you? Take care of it. Has God given you a clunker car? Don't go, stupid car, I'm just gonna drive it in the ground. Take care of it. There's a weird little verse in Proverbs that says the diligent person, the wise person prizes their possessions. They take care of the things that God has given them. Take care of the small that you have now and over time, God will probably give you more, a little more, a little more. And finally, in this season, it's a crazy season, right? There is so much anxiety about money and how we're feeling about money and what the future's gonna hold in the economy. Nobody knows what's coming and we're all getting a little bit rattled. Scripture would say, stay the course. Hold on. Don't light your hair on fire and run around with your billfold shooting money out everywhere. I gotta spend it while I got it. It's not what God wants. Hold on and stay the course. So what does God wanna do with our money? Like Ron said last week, he wants us to act like stewards, not owners, taking care, caretakers of what God has loaned out to us. God wants to use money to grow responsibility in us. And really what that is, is God wants to use money to mature us by teaching us things like, like uh, putting away my immediate desires for something longer 
term for looking away from, but I want this now and thinking more three months from now, nine months from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, maybe even the generation after me, planting seeds for a tree under which I will never sit putting off immediate pleasure, investing in the long hole, and using what God has given you to have a positive impact on your home, on the relationships you have, and on the world around you. And not looking at money as a way of just indulging, but looking at money as a great, powerful resource with which to do good. Let God teach you and grow you and train you in your character through how you get money and what you do with money. He's worth trusting. Well, let's pray. God, I I pray grace over all of us because we've all made a ton of mistakes about money. And I pray that we would receive your grace, your kindness and your forgiveness about that. And I pray for everybody who's watching today that this would be a watershed for us and we would start to operate differently about money. We would start to think differently about money. And I love God that your scriptures teach us practical things about living. It teaches us big giant spiritual truths, but it also teaches us practical things about living. And it shows us we can really trust you with our lives. And so I pray for those people who are watching today who maybe don't know you, but something in them goes, huh, God is applicable to my life. God has something to say to my life. And I ask that they would press in more and more to you. Help us to be faithful to you with our money. Help us to turn to you, follow your lead and let you grow good things in us through money, especially as we use it to do good things in the world. We ask for this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Jeff, thank you so much for using the scriptures to remind us that saving money is not just about having more margin or more financial freedom, but it's about us becoming more responsible and and growing a Christ-like character. And and Restoration Family, we want you to know that we're trying to be as responsible as we possibly can with the money that you give us every single week to help us love people into a lifestyle of passionately following Jesus. So right now, a lot of your resources are going into us starting more simple churches. In fact, we've started over 10 simple churches this month. Uh, We're hearing all kinds of stories about life transformation coming out of these simple churches. Uh, One story I heard this week was about a guy who's learning how to pray for the first time using a tool that we've been giving people in our simple churches for teaching people the basics of prayer. And and he, he said to his simple church leader, you know, the more I pray, the less I smoke weed. And the less I smoke weed and the more I pray, the clearer my thoughts are. Imagine that. Uh, Well, you know, these little wins, we wanna celebrate as a church because people are being transformed every single week in our simple churches. And Restoration, we could not do it without your support. So thank you so much for being such a generous church. And if you're a regular attender of our church online or in our simple churches, but you've not yet become a giver, I wanna encourage you to go to our website right now or go to our app. and and automate your offering so we can continue to see lives transformed and become more and more like Jesus. Right now, we've got one last worship song, so please wait a few moments before you leave and let's worship together with this one final song.